<clears throat> okay. So we're reading uh, Human Biology, 17th edition, by uh, Sylvia S. Matter and Michael Wendell Speck. Chapter 1, Exploring Life and Science, Diversity in Science. Our planet is home to a staggering diversity of life. Our species, Homo sapiens, is just one of the estimated 8.7 million different species, not counting bacteria that inhabit the globe. Life may be found everywhere. From the deepest ocean trenches to the tops of the highest mountains. Biology is the area of scientific study that focuses on the understanding of all aspects of living organisms. Human biology focuses not only on the biology of our species, but also the interactions with other species on the planet. This diversity of life is important to humans because it provides us with food, medicines, and the raw materials needed to manufacture the millions of items that make up our way of life, or that make our way of life possible. Equality, as important as our planet's biodiversity, is the diversity, oh, my bad, <laughs> equally, as important as our planet's biodiversity is the diversity of the people who study biology. Scientists rely upon their own experiences to ask questions, develop hypotheses, and design experiments or models to explain natural phenomena. Therefore, in order for the scientific community to ably address the challenges facing human society, from climate change to emerging disease, we need a diverse population of individuals with unique experiences and viewpoints to contribute to their ideas and opinions. As we will see throughout this text, there are many ways to study our world, and our diversity is a major strength in developing solutions. As you read through the as you read through the chapter, think about the following questions. What are some of the many ways a scientist can study biology? Two. Why would diversity in the scientific community play an important role in addressing how science can be or can address the needs of society? Again, one, what are some of the many ways a scientist can study biology? And two, why would diversity in the scientific community play an important role in addressing how science can address the needs of society? Chapter 1, Outline 1.1, The Characteristics of Life 1.2, Humans are related to other animals 1.3, Science as a Process 1.4, Science and the challenges facing society. One point one characteristics of life. Learning outcomes. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to one explain the basic characteristics common to all living organisms. Two, describe the level of organization of life. Three, explain how the study of evolution is important in understanding life. The science of biology is the study of living organisms and the environments they live in. All living organisms, in figure 1.1, share several basic characteristics. They, one, are organized. Two, acquire materials and energy. Three, are homeostatic. Four, respond to stimuli, five, reproduce and have the potential for growth, and six, have an evolutionary history.
life is organized. Life can be organized in a hierarchy of levels. Figure 1.2. Note that at the very base of this organization, atoms join together to form the molecules, which in turn make up a cell. A cell is the smallest structure and functional unit of an organism. Some organisms, such as bacteria, are single cell organisms. Humans are multicellular because they are composed of many different types of cells. For example, the structure of nerves in the human body allows these cells to conduct nerve impulses. A tissue is a group of similar cells that perform a particular function. Nervous tissue is composed of millions of nerve cells that transmit signals to all parts of the body. An organ is made up of several types of tissues, and each organ belongs to an organ system. The organ of an organ system works together to accomplish a common purpose. The brain works with the spinal cord to send commands to the body parts by way of the nerves organisms. Or by way of the nerves. Organisms such as trees and humans are a collection of organ systems. The level of biological organization extends beyond the individual. All the members of one species, a group of interbreeding organization, a group of interbreeding organisms well, I'm sorry back with that. The level of biological organization extends beyond the individual. All the members of one species in a particular area belongs to a population. A tropical grassland may have a population of zebras, acacia, trees, and humans, for example. The interacting populations of the grasslands make up a community. The community of populations interact with the physical environment to form an ecosystem. Finally, all the Earth's ecosystems collectively make up the biosphere. Figure 1.2 The levels of biological organization Life is connected from the atomic level to the biosphere. The cells is the basic unit of life and, compose, and comprises molecules and it comprises molecules and atoms. The sum of all life on the planet is called the biosphere. Starting at the bottom, you have the atom, the smallest unit of an element composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons. The molecule is an X, union of two or more atoms of the same or different element. The next one is a cell, the structure and functional unit of all living organisms. Next up is tissue, a group of cells with a common structure and function. Next is organ, composed of tissues functioning together for a specific task, like the brain or leaves. Next is the organ system, composed of several organs working together. The nervous system, the shoot system for uh, the plant, I guess. The organism, an individual, complex individuals, contain organ systems. So we as the human have many organ systems, like the nervous system, the respiratory system, the reproductive system, and so on and so forth. A species, a group of similar 
interbreeding organisms like humans or trees or dogs a population organisms of the same species in a particular area so there could be a population of human or a population of trees so there are many different types of humans in population and there are many different types of trees in the populations but each of those guys can be divided into species but they're still a major collection that habitat would also be called a community interacting populations in a particular area so these communities that they talk to each other um, or these yeah and I guess they live amongst each other as well so the zebra eats from the plants the bugs and the insects they eat from the plants um, the people who eat from the plants I mean we're all given and taken in this uh, community I guess interacting populations I, I don't know kind of gets confusing from there but that's what it says at least next up ecosystem the community plus the physical environment so I guess you have I guess that's what I was explaining before maybe with the community make sure you guys do your research no comment below comment <laughs> and then biosphere regions of the earth crust waters and atmosphere inhabited by living organisms all right guess and down on the bottom it says some of all life on the planet is called the biosphere all right so biology in your life how many cells are in your body the number of cells in a human body varies depending on the size of the person or and whether the cells have been damaged or lost however most estimates suggest there are well over 30 million cells in a human body to put this into perspective, there are only an estimated 3 trillion trees on the earth. Life requires materials and energy. Humans, like all living organisms, cannot maintain their organization or carry on life's achievements without an outside source of materials and energy. Energy is the capacity to do work. Like other animals, Humans acquire material and energy to eat food. Food provides nutrient molecules, which are used as building blocks for energy. It takes energy to maintain the organization of the cell and to maintain itself. Some nutrient molecules are broken down completely to provide the energy necessary to convert other nutrient molecules into the parts and products of cells. The breakdown of food is a component of our metabolism, or some of all chemical reactions that occur within a cell or organism. So metabolism, or the sum, or the breakdown of food is the, a component of our metabolism, or the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur within a cell's organism. Okay, so, uh, what organism? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I chopped that part out. I gotta remember about that. Alright, figure 1.3. Actually, I'm gonna keep going. The ultimate source of energy for the majority of life on Earth is the sun. Plants, algae, and some bacteria are able to harvest the energy of the sun and convert it to chemical energy by a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis produces organic molecules, molecules, organic molecules such as sugars that serve as the basis of the food chain for many other organisms, including humans and 
all other animals. Living organisms maintain an internal environment. I remember that one, that's, that's homeostasis. Our bodies are like a home. For the metabolic path within a cell to function correctly, for the for the metabolic path within a cell to function correctly, the environmental conditions of the cell must be kept within strict operating limits. Many of the met metabolic activities of a cell or organism function in maintaining homeostasis, a constant internal environment. In humans, many of our organ systems work to maintain homeostasis. For example, the human body temperature normally fluctuates slightly between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. That's 97.7 and 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. In general, the lowest temperatures usually occur between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. and the highest usually between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. However, Activity can cause the body temperature to rise, and inactivity can cause it to decline. The metabolic activities of cells, tissues, and organs, and organs are dependent on maintaining a relatively, a relatively constant body temperature. Therefore, a number of body systems, including the cardiovascular system and nervous system, work together to maintain a constant temperature. The body's ability to maintain a normal temperature is also somewhat dependent on the external temperature. Even though we can shiver when we are cold and perspire when we are hot, we will die if the internal temperature becomes overly cold or hot. This text emphasizes how all the systems of the human body help maintain homeostasis. For example, the digestive system takes in nutrients and the respiratory system exchanges gas within the environment. The cardiovascular system distributes nutrients and oxygen to the cell and picks up the wastes. The metabolic waste products of cells are excreted by the urinary system. The work of the nervous and endocrine systems is critical. Because systems coordinate and function of the other systems. Living organisms respond. It will be impossible to maintain homeostasis without the body's ability to respond to stimuli, both from the internal and external environment. Response to the external stimuli is more apparent to us because it involves movement, as when we click, quickly remove a hand from a hot stove, certain sensory receptors also detect a change in the internal environment, and then the central nervous system brings about an appropriate response. When you are startled by a loud noise, your heart rate or your heartbeat increases, which causes your blood pressure to increase. If blood pressure rises too high, the brain directs blood vessels to dilate, helping restore normal blood pressure. All life responds to external stimuli, often by moving towards or away from the stimuli, such as a sight of food. Organisms may use a variety of me mechanisms to move. The movement of humans and other animals is dependent on their nerves or the nervous and muscular skeletal systems. The leaves of plants track the passage of the sun during the day. When a house plant is placed near a window, the stems bend to face the sun. Movement of an animal, whether self-directed or in response to a stimuli, constitutes a large part of its behavior. Some behavior help us acquire food and reproduce. Figure 1.3. Humans and other animals must acquire energy. All life 
including humans and other animals such as eagles, big or bee, must acquire energy to survive. The method by which organisms acquire energy is dependent on the species. Big 1.4 Growth and Development Define Life A. A small acorn becomes a tree and B. Following fertilization, an embryo becomes a, a fetus by the process of growth and development. Living organisms reproduce and develop. Reproduction is a fundamental characteristic of life. Cells come into being only from pre-existing cells, and all living organisms have parents. When organisms reproduce, they pass on their genetic information to the next generation. Following the fertilization of an egg by a sperm cell, the result is a goat undergoes a rapid period of an egg by a sperm cell. Oh, by, uh, by my bad. <laughs> uh, undergoes a rapid period of growth and development. This is common in the most forms of life. Figure 1.4a illustrates that an acorn process to a seeding to a seedling before it becomes an adult oak tree. In humans, growth occurs as the fertilization my bad, as the fertilized egg develops into the fetus. Figure 1.4. Growth. We organize by an increase in size and often in the number of cells. It's Ah, my bad. Um, sorry, back at growth. Growth, we organize by an increase in size and often in the number of cells, is a part of development in a multicellular organism, such as a human. The term development is used to indicate all the changes that occur from the time the egg is fertilized until death. Therefore, it includes all the changes that occur during childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Development also includes the repair that takes place following an injury. The genetic information of all life is DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA contains the hereditary information. Oh, yeah. Contains the hereditary information that detects not only the structure of the cell, uh, but also its function. Take a second. The information in DNA is contained within genes. Short sequences of hereditary material that specify the instructions for a specific trait. Before reproduction occurs, DNA is replicated so an exact copy of each gene may be passed on to the offspring. When humans reproduce, a sperm carries genes contributed by a male into the egg, which contains genes contributed by a female. The genes direct both growth and development so that the organism will eventually resemble the parents. Sometimes mutations, minor variations, and these genes can cause the organism, the organism to be better suited for its environment. These mutations are the basis of evolutionary change. Humans have an evolutionary history. Evolution is the process by which a population changes over time. The mechanism by which evolution occurs is natural selection. When a new variation arises that allows certain members of a population to capture more resources, these members tend to survive and have more offspring than others, changing uh, unchanged members. Therefore, 
Each successive generation will include more members with a new variation, which represents an adaption to the environment. Consider, for example, populations of humans who live at high altitudes, such as the culture living at elevations of over 4,000 meters or 14,000 feet in the Tibetan Plateau. This environment is very low in oxygen. As the science as the science feature adapting the life at high elevations investigates, these populations have evolved an adaptation that reduces the amount of hemoglobin, the organ the oxygen carrying pigment in the blood. As the feature explains, this adaptation makes life at these altitudes possible. Evolution which has been going on since the organ since the origin of life and well continues as long as life exists explains both the unity and diversity of life. All organisms share the same characteristics of life because their ancestry can be traced to the first cells or cells. Organisms are diverse because they are adapted to different ways of life. Adapting to life at high elevations. Humans, like all other organisms, have an, elev an evolutionary history. This not only means we share common ancestors with other animals, but over time we demonstrate adaptations to changing environment conditions. To changing environmental conditions. My bad. <laughs> Let me just start back. It's gonna be a long edit. How long are we gonna read? Like 20 minutes max. Not all that. Our humans, like all other organisms, have an evolutionary history. This not only means that we share common ancestors with other animals, but over time we demonstrate adaptations to changing environmental conditions. One study of populations living in the high elevation mountains of Tibet, figure A, demonstrates how the process of evolution and adaptation influences humans. Normally, when a person moves to a higher altitude, the body may respond by making more hemoglobin, the component of blood that carries oxygen, which in turn thickens the consistency of the blood. For minor elevation changes, this does not present much of a problem. But for people who live in extreme elevations, some people in the Himalayas can live at elevations of over 13,000 feet or close to 4,000 meters. Excess hemoglobin can present a number of health problems, including chronic mountain sickness and diseases that affect people who live at high altitudes for extended periods of time. The problem is that the amount of hemoglobin increases the blood thickens and becomes more vicious. This can cause elevation blood pressure or hypertension, an increase in the formation of blood cells, blood clots, both of which have negative physiological effects. Because high hemoglobin levels would be a deterrent to people at high elevations, it makes sense that natural selection would favor individuals who produce less hemoglobin at high elevations. Such is the case with the Tibetan in the study. Researchers have identified an allele of a gene that reduces hemoglobin production at high elevations. Comparisons between Tibetans at both high and low elevations strongly suggest that selection was played a road in prevalence of high elevation allele 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 I'm not sure how to say that 
the gene is EPSA1. Located on the chromosome 2 of humans, EPSA1 produces a transcription factor that basically regulates which genes are turned on and off in the body. The process is called gene expression. The transcription factor produces by are produced by ESPA1 has a number of functions in the body. For example, in addition to controlling the amount of hemoglobin in the blood, the transcription factor also regulates other genes that direct how the body uses oxygen. When the researcher examines the variation in EPSA1, the Tibetan population, they discover that the Tibetan version greatly reduces the production of hemoglobin. Therefore, the Tibetan population has lower hemoglobin levels than people living in lower altitudes, allowing these individuals to escape the consequences of thick blood. How long did it take for it, the original people of variations? How long did it take for the original population to adapt to living at higher elevations? Initially, the comparison of variations in the genes between high elevation and low elevations, the uh, Tibetan population suggests that the event may have occurred over 3,000 3, year period, over a 3,000 year period. But researchers have a uh, uh, The researchers were skeptical of these data because they suggested a relatively rapid rate of evolutionary change. Additional studies of genetic databases yield at interesting findings. Yield an interesting finding. So the EPSA1 gene in Tibetans was identical to a similar gene found in an ancient group of humans called the Denisovans. Scientists now believe that the EPSA1 gene entered the Tibetan population around 40,000 years ago, either through interbreeding between early Tibetan and Denisovans, or from one of the immediate ancestors of this now lost group of early humans. Questions to consider. Number one, what other environments do you think could be studied to look for examples of human adaptation? And two, in addition to hemoglobin levels, do you think the people at high elevations may exhibit other adaptations? Check your progress, one, one, one. It's the basic characteristics of life. To summarize the levels of biological organization. Three, explain the relationship between adaptations and evolutionary change. Connecting the concepts. Both the hemiostasis and the evolutionary and the evolution of the central themes in the study of biology. For most examples of homeostasis and evolution refer to the following discussion. All right, so connecting the concepts, both the homeostasis and evolution are central themes in the study of biology. For more examples of homeostasis, the evolution and evolution refer to the following discussions. All right, so section 4.8 explain how the body temperature is regulated. Section 11.4 explores the roles of the kidneys in fluids and salts, homeostasis. And section 23.3 examples of evolutionary history of humans. All right, all right, cool, cool. Actually, right, so we are almost there. 1.2 humans are related to other animals. Learning outcomes. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to, one, summarize the place of humans in the overall classification of living organisms. Two, understand that humans have a 
cultural heritage. And three, describe the, relation, the relationship between humans and the biosphere. Biologists classify all humans as belonging to one of the three domains. The evolutionary relationship of these domains are presented in figure 1.5. Two of these domains, domains of bacteria and domain of archaea, contain prokaryotes, single-celled organisms that lack a nucleus. Organisms in the third domain, eukarya, contain, all contain cells that provide a nucleus or that possess a nucleus. Some of these organisms are single-celled, others are multicelled or multicellular. Humans are an example of a multicelled eukarya. Historically, the domain eukarya was divided into one of four kingdoms. However, the development of improved techniques in, analyze, in analyzing the DNA of organisms suggests that not all of the pro all of the protistas, the earliest eukaryotes, share the same evolutionary lineage, meaning that the evolution of the eukaryotes has occurred along several paths. A new, taxon, uh, a new taxonomic group called a supergroup was developed to explain these evolutionary relationships. These are correctly or yeah, these are current. Uh, there are currently six supergroups for domain eukarya. Over the past seven years, over the past several years, changes have been made in the supergroup classification as new as new research unveils relationships between these organisms. Yeah. While these relationships are still being studied and analyzed, current thinking places the animals in the same supergroup, like old thicorn. as the fungi the opus as the fungi the traditional yeah I, I have no idea how to say that order <laughs> the traditional kingdom level of classification with the domain of eukarya is still widely used and is often placed beneath the what is that? Supergroup classification. The four kingdoms are shown in figure 1.6 and include the following. Kingdom Prostista, commonly called the Prostists. Is, this is a very diverse group of eukaryotic organisms, ranging from single-celled forms to a few multicellular organisms. Some Prostists use photosynthesis to manufacture food and some must acquire their own food. As we mentioned in the diverse nature of these organisms. You know what? We're gonna stop here on page eight. We didn't get far at all. Eight pages.